Okay, next up we've got Laurent Bernard who's going to be talking to us about the evolu evolu ah, evolution of cube proxy. Oh, yeah, yeah you, should, you should wear that, yes. I, I'll do that. <laughs> okay. um, uh, yeah, it, no, the, the top, there's a slider on the top. Yes. Is it green? It's not green. So, that, uh, okay, should be good now. Okay. Oh, that's better. better. Yay. So, as I was saying, uh, I work at Datadog. Uh, we're a SaaS monitoring company. And I put a few figures on the slide, but what matters most is we run a pretty large infrastructure and we run a lot of Kubernetes clusters, some of them um, very big, up to 3,000 nodes. And of course, as we run large clusters, we've had uh, a few issues with Kubernetes and some of them related to accessing services at, at this scale. And that's why I got into, um, I got very involved with, with Kubeproxy and in particular with IPVS mode for, for Kubeproxy. So just to get started, uh, some very quick background on, on Kubeproxy itself. So Kubeproxy is a component that's responsible for uh, managing the service abstraction in Kubernetes. So it's a component that runs on every node. And it's going to enable access to cluster IP, which is a virtual IP fr from this node. Um, and so basically, when you try to access a service, you try to access this virtual IP. And Kubeproxy is responsible for transforming this IP into a pod backend. If we look at what a deployment and a service look like, um, here on this example, you have a deployment of three pods. And, and what matters for, for, for these deployments is it has a label, which is the app is called Eco. And then you have a matching service on the right hand side, which is uh, selecting pods from this deployment by using the selector saying, select all the pods uh, with label app equal Eco's. And when you create all these objects, you're going to, to have all, all this created. So first, you're going to create the de deployment. The deployment is going to create a replica set, which is responsible for creating all the pods. So in, in our case, we have, we have three pods. And the replica set is going to manage this, these three pods. So as I was saying before, all these pods have, have a label. And the service is matching uh, the same label. So it's going to consider all these pods as backend for, for the service. There's actually an additional component, which is called an endpoint. And this component is completely managed by Kubernetes, by the control plane. You will almost never see it because you don't interact with it. And this endpoint is actually an optimization so that uh, Kubeproxy and all the nodes doesn't have to watch all the pod objects, which can be pretty big. Uh, a pod object is easily, uh, easily a thousand bytes, so quite often bigger. And if, of course, if you have a large amount of pods and a large amount of service, if you need to add in memory the description of all the pods on all the nodes, it's going to be pretty big. So the endpoint object is actually a very simplified view of all the IPs backing a given service. So in, in my example here, you can see that the endpoint is a very simple structure with the IP of all the pods backing, backing the service. There's an additional concept, which is called readiness. Um, in Kubernetes, you can associate a readiness probe uh, with a deployment. And in this case, a pod won't be ready unless it satisfies this readiness probe. And the way it works is you can, for instance, specify an HTTP probe and connect to a path and verify that it's, it's healthy. And the way it's used is basically if, if a pod is not ready because it can't serve traffic, it won't be added as an endpoint, so when an application tries to connect to the service, it won't be routed to that pod. So if I get back to the example I was giving before uh, with my echo service with three pods, if I connect in another pod and connect to a virtual IP, uh, the IP in, in 10.200 here, this is the IP of the service, uh, I'm actually going to be connected to the pod, and as you can see on this slide, the pod has just given as an answer their own source IP. And you can see that I'm actually getting to three different pods, which are the three pods backing the service. Of course, if one of the pods was not ready, I wouldn't be routed there. And so if of the three pods, only two were ready, I would see only two IPs there. 
So this is the very quick introduction on, our, on, on what uh, Proxy, what Proxy does. So how does this all work? So in order for a pod to be added to an endpoint, it needs to be ready, it needs to be running on a node, and it needs to be ready. And the component that's responsible for giving this information to the control plane is the kubelet. The kubelet is the main component running on each Kubernetes node. And the kubelet is responsible for starting pod by interacting with the container runtime and also performing the health check if there's a health check for, for the pod. And the kubelet will all the time give information on, on the pod that are running on the host and update the status. Is the pod running? Is the pod ready? All this information. And this information is going to be reported to the API server and stored in NetCD, which is the data store for, for Kubernetes. And this is now translated to endpoint by a very specific controller in Kubernetes, which is called the endpoint controller. And the role of this controller is just to maintain the endpoint objects. So the endpoint controller is going to watch for all the services and all the pods and update the endpoint object for all the services based on all the pod matching a given label that are ready, of course. Now that we have this endpoint object that is synchronized uh, by the endpoint controller, if we want to access a service from, from a node, from a container, uh, this is where kubeproxy enters into play. So kubeproxy is responsible for watching services and the endpoint associated with each service and to configure something that I call a procure, and you're gonna see why I call it a procure, because you have different ways to do that. And when the client is going to connect to the service using the virtual IP, the, the procure is responsible for sending traffic to actual pods. Okay, so I'm a client, I'm trying to talk to the echo service I mentioned earlier, I'm sending traffic to the virtual IP, and the procure is gonna route me either to pod one or pod, B, or pod two in my, in my example. So there are different implementation of the Proxer. Um, the initial implementation was, was a user space implementation. So you can see this as an HA proxy, for instance. So you would have a local proxy running and all traffic would be running through it. The actual implementation looks like this. So when you have a client, it's gonna be rerouted and when it sends traffic to a, to a service IP, the traffic is going to be rerouted to kubeproxy itself, okay? So you have an IP table rules that's going to redirect traffic to kubeproxy. And the way it works is for every service in the cluster, kubeproxy is locally going to find an available port, bind it, and create an IP table rule that's going to redirect traffic for the service directly to kubeproxy. And then kubeproxy itself is going to do the actual load balancing to pod and connect to pod one and pod two in, in my example. So the way it works, if you look at IP tables on the, on the instance itself, you can see that in the pre-routing chain, there's this rule capturing everything, okay, and sending traffic to um, the portal's container chain. And in that chain, you have one rule for each service uh, in the cluster. And this was actually very simple. Um, if traffic, if the destination of the traffic is uh, the service IP, uh, VIP on the slide, to the service port, then traffic is redirected to the IP of the node, uh, which kubeproxy is binding, on a specific port that's been attributed locally by kubeproxy amongst uh, available ports. So this works fine, but as you can imagine, this is not very performance, because every time you send traffic, traffic is gonna be sent from kernel land to user land to the proxy, and then back on the interface, so it's not great. Also, if you do that, there's no way to actually keep the source IP. If you're accessing the service from a container, uh, the IP you're gonna see uh, at the destination is gonna be the node IP of kubeproxy itself because of course, kubeproxy is gonna initiate the connection to the backends. So this is not recommended anymore. I'm pretty sure if some of you are running Kubernetes today, you're not running in that mode. Um, it's almost, it's, it's kind of duplica duplicated, but it's definitely not recommended anymore. And the current default implementation since Kubernetes 1.2 is IP tables, which I'm going to talk about just right now. Um, so the first, um, the first mode was user space, and the second is IP tables, and this one is the default, and once again, if you're running kubeproxy, it's very likely. This is the mode you're currently using. 
and it's the one that's used in most managed offerings. Uh, if you look at GKE or EKS, for instance, on GCP and AWS, this is the mode they, they use. So in IP tables mode, uh, we still use IP tables for redirection, but we're not redirecting traffic to QProxy. We're directly using uh, IP tables to, to redirect traffic to, to backend pods. So if you can, you can see in this example that we're sending traffic to a virtual IP, and this virtual IP is denoted to a pod IP, okay? And the, when the traffic comes back, you hit the contract and you're reverse natted to, to the pod itself. So it looks pretty simple. When we say it that way, it's actually uh, a bit complicated. So the design um, is, is it, it this one. So basically, same as before, uh, QProxy will hook into the pre-routing chain and the output chain for local traffic and everything will be sent to a chain called Cube Services. And that, send, that chain will do the same type of matching as we had before. So it will match the cluster IP and the, and, and the service ports and send traffic to a chain for the service itself. So what's important here is you have a new chain for every service. So of course, if you have a lot of services, you're going to have a lot of chains and your IP table configuration is going to be kind of a mess. In that chain, you have one rule for each backend, and this is where things start to be a bit hacky. Uh, as you can see here, um, QProxy is using the statistic IP tables model to, to randomly send traffic to the backends, and the way it does it is, well, there's a probability for the rule to apply, and if the rule apply, you route it to a pod. Uh, as you can see, when you read it for the first time, this is not very intuitive because instead of seeing uh, one third, one third, one third, which you would expect if you have three backends. It's actually one third for the first one because there's one, one chance out of three the rule is going to apply. But then, if, you, if, the, rule, if the rule is not matched, uh, you only have two backends, and so that way it's 50% 50, 50 for the second one. And finally, um, you have a chain for each endpoint for a service, and this chain is just responsible for doing DNAT itself. So modifying the destination IP to use the pod IP. And it's also doing something that's uh, a bit surprising when you look at it the first time. For traffic that is sent back to the pod uh, where it was coming from, so happen traffic, we need to use SNAT. So let's, let's look into that because this is a bit uh, complicated. So imagine I'm in pod one and I want to access a service that's backed by pod one, okay? Uh, and other pods. If traffic, if I just do DNAT, uh, the, after DNAT, the traffic has, is going to have the same source, source IP and destination IP. And of course, this will not work great. And so in that case, uh, what IP table does is it's doing source nodding to the host IP. So traffic can be reverse nodded back uh, to the destination. Another thing you can do with Kubernetes services, people tend not to use it much, and I think it's a good idea because it's a bit complicated too, is to use affinity. So what you, what you can't want for your application is for all traffic from the same source IP to get to the same backend um, because you have some sort of uh, affinity constraints. And as you can imagine, doing persistency with IP tables is not easy. So the way this is done is using the recent module, which usually people use for security to avoid uh, port scanning or DDoS. And in that case, what happens is when you denat traffic to a pod IP, you also insert this source IP into a specific set, uh, specific recent set with the same name for, for the endpoint. And then the next time you hit the service chain, okay? You remember this chain where you had all the load balancing rules. In addition to the load balancing rules, at the beginning of the chain, you have these rules there that are checking if the source IP is matching against the set that exists. And if it does, traffic is directly gonna be sent to the matching endpoint without, using, without going through load balancing rules. So this works, but this also feels quite, I mean, a bit hacky and, um, and it's very difficult to, to expire connections and do, do these kinds of things. So in terms of limitations, uh, well, using uh, IP tables to do load balancing is kind of a surprising idea. Uh, 
It works surpri surprisingly well, though, uh, and it's been running for, I mean, many, most people are running Kubernetes this way. It's very hard to debug, though. Uh, very quickly, you have tens of thousands of IP table rules. It's very hard to understand. And to be honest, the, uh, the last time I, I was running um, in IP table mode on a mid-sized cluster of about 1,000 nodes, we had, I think, 50,000 IP table rules. And when you want to debug it and understand what's happening, it's, it's pretty tricky. Worse, uh, there's actually a huge performance impact, both on the data plane and, and the control plane. So here, I'm, I'm just quoting from a very interesting talk uh, uh, from KubeCon in Berlin 2017. And this is the impact of IP tables on routing performances. So what happens is, of course, if you have a lot of rules to traverse before getting to your endpoint, this means uh, it's going to take some time to go through all the, all the rules in the chains. And as you have more, more backends and more services, this can actually take quite some time. You can see in this, in this extreme example here with 50,000 services that at one point it's taking like uh, about seven milliseconds just to get through the chain. So you want to establish a connection and just going through the IP table chains is going to take you a few milliseconds. And the worst part is actually not the data plane, it's the control plane. Because the way QProxy works when used in IP table mode is every time there's a change in endpoint of services, it's going to recompute the full set of IP table rules. And as I was saying before, this can be tens of thousands of rules and do a single atomic reload of all these rules. So it's fine on mid-sized clusters or small-sized cluster, but on large clusters, this very easily takes a few minutes. Um, so if you, if you look into issues in, on the Kubernetes uh, GitHub, you're gonna see that many people are actually getting timeout errors because by default, QProxy time, times out after five minutes when trying to reload rules. But it's very easy to get to, to go far above five minutes. You can see this example that with 5,000 services, uh, it takes more than 10 minutes. And if you reach like 20,000 services, QProxy becomes completely unusable. Uh, it, uh, in this example here, it took them five hours to just reload one set of rules. As you can imagine, on large clusters, endpoints tend to move quite a lot. And so you would want things to be like updated in the, in the matter of a few seconds. So five hours is definitely too long. And this gets us to IPVS. So the idea of IPVS is, well, IPVS is a load balancer built into the kernel. Um, and so, of course, it's designed for load balancing. And the way it works is actually pretty, pretty logical. For each service, you have a virtual uh, server in IPVS backed by real servers. And when you initiate a connection, your, your application is just going to send traffic to, uh, to IPVS. IPVS is going to select a backend, and traffic is going to be routed to this backend. And I'm just mentioning the IPVS contract because, as you'll see later, we've had some issues uh, with the IPVS contract. When a pod is deleted, um, it's removed from the real service. So you, could, you can see here that uh, backend X is not, no, no longer a real server for service S. And what happens in that case, in the kernel, is traffic to this backend is going to be, to be dropped. So this is not ideal. And the way we actually address it with IPVS is we use uh, the CCT that I put on the top, which is going to make sure that any new packet to the SSH connection is going to be to, to clean up the IPVS contract and trigger a reset to notify both backends. So that works pretty great, but it's still not ideal. This means we don't have any kind of graceful termination. Um, so imagine you're connect, currently connected to an HTTP server and downloading data. If, uh, if the pod is moved to terminating state, usually what you would expect is for the communication to terminate and things to continue fine afterwards. But in this case, what QProxy was doing in the first IPVS implementation was just remove the real server so the connection would be abruptly, uh, abruptly cut. This wasn't an issue with IP tables because even if you remove the IP tables rules, your entry was still hitting the contract, so traffic was still flowing fine uh, after removing the backend. So addressing this took some time, but we, we had an implementation of graceful termination in, in Kubernetes 1.12, and, and the way this works, if you're familiar with IPVS, is pretty, pretty logical. 
So what we do is when a pod is set to terminating mode, uh, we update the weight of the real server to zero. So no new connection will be established to this backend, but, but established connections are still going to work. So this works a lot better. For garbage collection, it's actually uh, easy. The way it works is um, we have a thread that's running uh, every, every few seconds, every minute, I think. That's, watch, that's looking for all the backends for a given, um, all the connections for a given backend. And when this gets to zero, uh, the backend is removed. That's, that's perfectly fine because it's removed. As pods go down, they send a fin and the connection is, is, is removed. There's one, um, one small issue, um, which is what happens if uh, the, the backend is actually crashing and you don't get a fin and the connection is not properly shut down. And in that, in that case, you have this typical contract issue that's not specific to IPVS, which is, well, the application is not going to notice that the backend is gone until either the entry expires in the, in the contract or it, it retries sending packets until it detects that the connection is stale, which by default uh, takes 15 minutes uh, on, on, on most, Linux, most Linux installations. Um, and if you, want, if you encounter this kind of issues, what, what we recommend in the, uh, IP, in the Qproxy IPVS community is to lower TCP retries to, uh, to, to actually detect that the connection is failed much, much earlier. IPVS connection tracking has been a bit complicated. Uh, as, I mean, I'm, I'm sure most of you know all the issues you can have with a contract in Linux. Uh, IPVS has its own connection tracking system and it's, in terms of granularity, it's much less granular than the standard contract. And you can see that the default timeout has pre are pretty high. And the main issue uh, we've seen with this is actually the UDP timeout, which is set by default to five minutes. And it's, this was very bad, especially for DNS traffic, uh, because it, as you can imagine, any DNS query would actually get an entry in the contract and it would be kept for five minutes. So that's one of the reasons we decided to disable graceful termination for UDP and only do it for TCP. So for UDP, if uh, as soon as the backend is removed, we just remove uh, the real server. It's not perfect, but it's much better and it solves a lot of issues. One of the things we've added very recently to the IPVS implementation is an easy way to set timeout in your configuration. And we're probably gonna change the default timeout soon but we've been uh, very careful uh, with doing that because we don't want to break existing installation. One of the main things we plan to do is probably to change the default UDP timeout to 30 seconds because the largest use case by far in Kubernetes environments of, of UDP connections is DNS traffic and 30 second timeout is much more than, more than enough. Um, ideally, what we'd want is be able to set the weight to zero when the pod enter, when a backend pod enters terminating state and just remove it when the pod is deleted, but the current endpoint API doesn't allow this. So very quickly, in terms of status for IPVS, um, it works pretty well at large scale. Uh, we've been running IPVS on very large cluster for some time and it's been very okay for us. We didn't encounter any of the scale issues I was mentioning before. Be careful though, it's not 100% feature parity with IP tables implementation, which, in, which is still the, the reference one. And it took us some time to tune all the IPVS parameters to make it, to make it better, but we're, we're getting there. A, a few things I wanted to mention that are common challenges to, for QProxy regardless of the implementation. So the first one is the scalability of the control plane. So you remember before that the interaction of QProxy with the rest of the cluster is using the endpoint object. And, and the thing is, every time there's an update to a service, a new pod, a pod changing, uh, becoming re ready or not ready, then the full endpoint object is recomputed and this full endpoint object is sent to all QProxies. So it's fine if your endpoint object is small enough, but as your endpoint starts to get big, if you have, for instance, in my example, 2,000 backends, uh, this can lead to a lot of traffic. So in my example here, imagine you have uh, an, a service with 2,000 backends, uh, 
each node will receive 200 kilobytes of, of traffic for any given update, okay, so that's quite a lot. And of course, the API server needs to send this information to all the nodes in the cluster. Which means, well, in that example, uh, about a gigabyte of traffic, so that's quite a lot, but worst. If you're, using, um, if you're doing a rolling update, which means you're going to update all your pods in, the, uh, in your 2000 backend service, it means one by one, they're going to be deleted and replaced, which means at minimum, you're going to do what I was saying before, 2000 times for 2000 backends, which, is going to, which, which means you're going to send two terabytes of traffic, and this is, of course, quite a lot. So this has been addressed very recently in Kubernetes by using endpoint slices. So the idea is that instead of using a single endpoint object for large services, an endpoint can actually be backed by multiple slices, and the maximum size of the slice is 100 endpoints, and so you only need to synchronize the slice where an endpoint change happens, which means it's much more efficient. So this is still in beta, but uh, this has been uh, available since 117, so it's still pretty recent. Another very common issue uh, we've seen with um, QProx implementation in th is the size of the contract. Uh, all the current IPVS implementation, oh, oh, sorry, QProx implementation rely on the contract, which means if you have services that get a lot of traffic, you create a lot of connection entry in the contract. It's especially bad for DNS. Uh, usually in Kubernetes, you have a service that's supplying DNS to the cluster and it's backed by pods. And of course, for each query, you then create entries in the contract. And, and if you run Kubernetes at large scale, what's gonna happen is you're going to fill the contract and drop your DNS queries, which is not great. So there are different ways to, to, to address that. A very common uh, way that's becoming a standard is to use a node local DNS cache on every node. Okay, so when you do queries, you would first hit the local cache and upstream queries we use TCP. So this is much more efficient and this is what's being used uh, in, in, most set, in most new setups today. Another thing is we had a very good, um, very good surprise with kernel 5.0. Uh, in this example here, you can see that um, we have a set of uh, container backing the DNS service and we were very surprised that the number of entries in the contract was very different we had like a bimodal distribution of number of entries in the contract for these nodes providing um, GNS. And we discovered that on 5.0 kernel, the number of entries in the contract was much lower than on four, that on 4.15. And the reason is these two commits here that optimize the way the kernel does uh, contracting of UDP in, uh, in, in, in kernel 5. And this is much better, as you can see, like the number of entries in the contract was divided by two, thanks to these two commits. So it was very good, great news. I'm almost done. I just wanted to mention uh, very recent features of, of Kubeproxy. The first one is uh, dual stack support. So Kubernetes as a whole is supporting IPv4 and IPv6 uh, in alpha since 116, and of course Kubeproxy is doing it too. And the most recent change, and the most recent feature, is a support for topology aware routing, which will allow you to, pre to connect in preference to local pod, local meaning on the same node or in the same zone, same data center, uh, and not load balance to all the, all the pods. So this is still in alpha, but pretty promising. And, well, in conclusion, um, Kubeproxy is working pretty well at very significant scale. Uh, there's still a lot of effort in that place because as, I mean, this talk was all about the, all the problems we're trying to solve with, with Kubeproxy, but we're, we're getting there. The main issue is IP tables and IPVS are not great match uh, for the service abstraction because they were not designed to do client side load balancing. I mean, they work, but they were definitely not designed to do that. So we can make them work, but it feels hacky and we've had a lot of issues. So a very promising alternative uh, in terms of implementation is eBPF-based load balancing. And I, I think some of you uh, were there earlier to see the talk by Daniel Borkman on how they do the implement the service abstraction in Cilium. And this is very promising because, well, this is eBPF-based, was designed from the ground up to work with Kubernetes, and it's very efficient. And actually, in Datadog, we're actually moving to this implementation 
instead of Qproxy in most of our clusters. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm Thank you. And we're unfortunately out of time, so questions would have to be outside yeah. the room. I'm I'll sorry. I'll stay around if you have questions.